So, folks, my goodness, Trump and his cronies are in a world of hurt right now. We're talking about Trump cronies, top Trump cronies like Jim Jordan and many others, because treason alarm bells are ringing, because at the very best, they're just dupes for foreign enemies, and at worst, they're out-and-out treasonists, and that's where the charges are are flying guys it's getting really ugly and it has Jim Jordan getting destroyed in committee by top Democrats for avoiding subpoenas and trying to hide the truth but also running out of meetings with reporters and fellow politicians because he's being exposed so I want you to watch all of this because it entails the humiliation of Jim Jordan taking him down legally, treason charges flying, Capitol Police everywhere, all of this. But it also connects to Donald Trump because any treason by his chief congressional goons is also hitting him immediately. But I want to read this to you. It talks about lawyers and the criminal consequences of this all before we get into the insane clips, hilarious and insane that I'm going to show you. And it says here, in a post to Twitter, former New York uh, uh, Assistant Attorney General Tristan Snell said that Jim Jordan, Chuck Grassley, and James Comer were either duped by Smirnov and the Kremlin or they were in on it. Either way, DOJ must subpoena every single communication Jordan, Grassley, and Comer had with or about him and anything related, Snell added. Also posting was a a Tennessee Democratic Election Commissioner, Christy D. Jackson, who said that the Democrats, if the Democrats take back the House, they need to censure Comer and Jim Jordan and remove them from committees. National security journalist, journalist Marcy Wheeler said the detention report that Smirnov is spooked up means that Comer and Jordan were easy dupes of Russian spies. Prosecutors argued that Smirnov should remain in custody after his arrest, saying that he has contacts with Russian intelligence and is pol- actively peddling new lies. And it gets so much worse here. Listen to Jim getting torn up in committee and by the media. It is essentially glorious. Thank you. And joining us now, CNN senior legal analyst Ellie Honig. Uh, Ellie, th- there's a lot to get to here, but as a former prosecutor, I know this is national security world, but as a former prosecutor, can you answer kind of the glaring question for me is how can you be running a confidential informant for a decade? And then this indictment just paints the picture of an absolute fabulist. Um, where, where, where's the disconnect there? Is that normal? How does that actually work? Well, Phil, the short answer is the FBI got burned here. The FBI handles thousands of what we call confidential informants at any given time. And what a confidential informant is, is a person who's providing information to the FBI, to the Justice Department, but without the expectation of that person ever taking the stand and testifying. It's essentially a secret source of information. And one of the challenges with any confidential informant is the FBI and DOJ have to verify that person, have to confirm the things that they're being told. And here they clearly failed to do that. It is a real embarrassment for the FBI. It's a black eye to have someone who has been providing information, apparently very what the FBI took as important information for a decade. And now to learn that he lied to them. They got played. They failed here. That happens. I'm not excusing it, but it's a failure by the FBI. But for people waking up to this news who may think, oh, this changes everything in terms of the DOJ probe against Hunter Biden, that's about firearm possession and tax issues. Does this impact that at all? Right. So this should have no impact on the actual pending indictments, plural, against Hunter Biden. And it's important to note, by the way, the person who's running all of these investigations is the special counsel, David Weiss, a person who was put in office as U.S. attorney by Donald Trump in 2018, then confirmed to the Senate in 2019. Now, the special counsel has brought two indictments against Hunter Biden, one of them a federal case in Delaware relating to firearms possession, the other a federal case in California relating to tax fraud. Neither of those cases appears to be implicated by anything this particular informant, Mr. Smirnov, said or any of his information. So I think those two cases will continue on. We have seen reporting that Hunter Biden's attorneys are going to argue that, well, to the extent the FBI relied on this person's statement at all, they should have to go back to the deal, the plea deal that they had in place, because the reason that the FBI backed out on that plea deal, according to Hunter Biden's lawyers, is because they were relying on faulty information from Mr. Smirnov. I think that's an interesting argument. I think it's perhaps overly aggressive. So I think those two indictments are going to stay in place and proceed. 
Ellie, if you're reading this indictment, you'll say, wow, a lot of that looks familiar to what we've heard from House Republicans over the course of the last several months related to their <laughs> impeachment inquiry. And the reason why is because it is. Yeah. Um, and I think my question is, does this undercut that? What happens next if you're Jim Jordan or if you're James Comer? Oh, yeah, this is an embarrassment uh, for, for Jim Jordan and for James Comer any way you cook it. Look, the impeachment inquiry, which was officially authorized by the House in December, I believe was already built on a shaky foundation. But this guy was a big part of that foundation. And now it has crumbled altogether. I mean, the, pr the primary information that he provided to the FBI on which the House relied is essentially that there was this multi-million dollar bribe payoff made to Hunter Biden and to Joe Biden. And now the FBI has figured out that that was false, so false, so obviously false, that they've now charged Smirnoff with making false statements for saying that. So I think the House impeachment inquiry uh, had a flimsy basis to begin with, and, and now they've got nothing. Okay, changing gears here in a major way. Uh, I think it's really interesting what the- It makes a small grammatical change on page 17 of the report. It does not affect the substance of the report. And I yield back. Who seeks recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentlemen, <laughs> Gentleman from California, Mr. Swallow is recognized. <clears throat> then I'll come to you, I think. It's... Mr. Chairman, is this a joke? No, seriously, is this hearing a joke? This is a committee that now cares about subpoena compliance, and we're going to hold somebody in contempt for subpoena compliance? That's really interesting. Because, to me, it seems like you believe we all had our memories wiped 608 days ago when you failed to honor your own subpoena. You see, on May 31, 2022, as the January 6th committee was investigating the greatest crime ever committed in America with the most arrests, the most convictions, a crime against our Congress, our Constitution, our democracy, all they wanted was for you and a few of your colleagues to cooperate, to provide any information you had. And what you all did for 608 days and counting, you didn't show up. And you want us to take this proceeding seriously where you have an issue with somebody else's compliance with a subpoena, somebody who actually is willing to come forward publicly, something you were not willing to do, something you and Mr. McCarthy and others who were asked to testify were not willing to do. So seriously, is this a joke? If it's a joke, great. This whole Congress has been a joke, so it would be in line and on brand with what has been taking place. But I have to ask, like, how dumb do you think the American people are that you would seek to hold someone in contempt when you are 608 days, 15 hours, 21 minutes, and 47 seconds out of compliance of your own subpoena. I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if, if it is your practice to look the other way when crimes are committed, but it's not my practice, and it's not my colleague's practice. So what is this really all about? It's about this chairman, Speaker Johnson, and the MAGA majority acting as insurrection LLP, creating the biggest law firm in Washington, D.C., to work every single day in this building on behalf of just one client, the former president, Donald Trump, and to carry out his petty grievances every single day. Okay, that's great. You won the majority. It's your prerogative. But the cost to the American people is we aren't doing a single thing in this committee to address gun violence, the mass shootings that occurred in the three weeks that we were gone. We haven't done anything to address what's going on at the border, a president who's willing to negotiate and find ways to better secure it. We're not doing anything to bring down the cost of health care and take on the pocketbook financial breathing room issues that the American people care about. Okay, let's talk about Hunter. Mr. Comer and Mr. Jordan said, we want Hunter Biden to come in. Hunter Biden said, okay, I will come in. Mr. Comer said two different times, we will take his testimony publicly or we will take it privately. We will take it publicly or we will take it privately. Hunter Biden said, okay, let's do it publicly. I don't trust you all to take it privately because you haven't released the depositions that you have taken privately. Can't blame him for that. He wants to come in and testify publicly. 
You won't take yes for an answer. And so then you move it to let's take it privately. I think you want to take it privately because you have nothing. I think you want to take it privately because you don't want to see Marjorie Taylor Greene display the non-consensual nudes from Hunter's laptop again. I think that's why you want to take it privately. But he comes in anyway. You won't take yes for an answer. And let me just break some news for you, Mr. Chairman. Just down the hallway, Hunter Biden is sitting in the Oversight Committee. He's ready to testify publicly, it appears. So let me just challenge you one more time. If you're so eager to take his testimony publicly, I move that we adjourn right now and take his public testimony and bring him in here right now. Is the gentleman making a motion? Yes. Question is federal prosecutors, and that is what has been the cause of his indictment, saying that uh, the FBI and DOJ saying that he essentially made all of that up, and that could be the source of Russian disinformation. Now, for the first time, we've put the question directly to the Republicans who are investigating all of this, including the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Jim Jordan, who I asked him about this revelation and whether he would take back what he had said about the president being involved in this bribery scheme, and Jim Jordan was defiant about the president's involvement in a bribery scheme now that Alexander Smirnov has proven to have made it up and it was based off Russian intelligence. It doesn't change the four fundamental facts. Hunter Biden was on the, put on the board of Burisma, gets paid a million dollars a year. Fact number two, he's not qualified to be on the board. He said so himself in an interview, I don't know, with you or, or some network. Fact number three, Zolachevsky and Pazarsky, the two executives at Burisma, specifically asked Hunter Biden, can you weigh in with D.C. and help us deal with the pressure we are facing from the prosecutor? Fact number four, Joe Biden, then, then he gets called. Hunter Biden calls his dad, according to Devin Archer, Hunter Biden's business partner. Fact number four, Joe Biden then goes to Ukraine three days later and conditions the release of the money, American tax money, on the firing of the prosecutor who was applying the pressure to the company that Hunter Biden said on the board but of. You said, fact, you, said, you said the 1023 is the most corroborating piece of information it you have. It corroborates, but it doesn't, it doesn't change those fundamental facts. So now, It's not true. Well, so, okay, so it's, it's the, the FBI told us that this source was so important. So that is one thing that Jim Jordan did actually say just a few weeks ago about that information from the FBI informant who is alleged to have made all of this up, saying that this is what Jordan said, this is the most corroborating evidence we have, is that 1023 form, referring to the form that the FBI officials filled out while they were interviewing this informant. He said this is coming from a highly credible, confidential human source. And now we know that that is not true, but it really underscores the challenges that Republicans face here in trying to build the case to impeach Joe Biden. A number of members, especially in the rank and file, especially from swing districts, simply believe that the case has not been made. And that was before this indictment of this FBI informant. Shows you the hurdles they face as they hit, face a critical moment in this more than year-long investigation into the president with James Biden, the president's brother here behind closed doors. That testimony about to begin in a matter of minutes. Hunter Biden expected to come next week.